Welcome everyone to the Wicked Wit book launch and reading. We will we have about 20 poets with us today who uh, contributed poems to that anthology. So that's a little well that's over half of the poets who are in the anthology. Um, I'm really pleased with how this turned out and I'm really pleased with the work in this anthology. Um, I think it's something given the times we're in now, it's, it's good to read a bit of something that gives us a bit of levity that has a bit of a wry touch to it. And um, Lord knows we've all been through enough this year. So. It's been its own wicked wit. Um, we're going to start today with um, one of our judges who, John Gorman. John, you want to just raise your hand? So people, great. Um, he was one of three judges. The other two were Danley Antigua and Jason Koo from both actually now living in Brooklyn. Um, John has is a retired professor emeritus of literature at the University of Houston, Clear Lake, where he was part of its founding faculty. And he continues to be active in the local poetry community, as well as having led a critique group in Galveston, Texas for many years. Take it away, John. Okay. Now, it seems to me that I'm talking, are people hearing me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm to talk for three minutes. So it's now two minutes and 58 seconds. Um, <clears throat> it's quite an honor to be asked to be one of these judges that uh, I just wish that we could take a field trip to Brooklyn and, and talk to Jason and, and Diane Lee as well. Um, and it's an honor uh, to have been trusted by Fran. Fran has been, a, a, you know, this is, a, a, I didn't advance this with her, so it will be a surprise. But Fran has been a great blessing to the Houston poetry scene. And um, she has been able to keep public poetry going when uh, other events on which we've counted, like the first Friday in Houston Poetry Fest, have been shut down by COVID. Um, the, uh, the, the coffee house scene has been much diminished. And you know, just, uh, there's nothing good about COVID. There are, there are poems, you know, I've written one myself that people liked on Facebook. Um, but the, uh, the, that Fran has found a way and uh, that it has been a great, very positive presence on the Houston poetry scene. And the Houston poetry scene has been a rich one. People who aren't from Houston haven't had the experience of living here. Um, probably don't think of Houston as a big poetry town. Uh, and yet it is that the wonderful poets, lots of groups, lots of action, lots of readings. And I just hope that uh, the virus will go away. I know we were told by the outgoing president that it would be gone by the 4th of November um, or that whatever it is the day after the election, um, but that seems not to have happened. Um, I am an emeritus professor of literature and taught a lot of creative writing, but it not I wasn't um, hired exclusively to do that. The, uh, the, one of the things that was nice about retiring was that I didn't have to sit in judgment on people uh, anymore. But now that I'm uh, uh, a judge for a contest, that's been put in abeyance. But it's a wonderful experience. The positive thing of, about being a contest judge is that you get to read so many poems, you get to meet so many poets that, the, uh, that I've always thought of poetry and of the poetry readings, especially of, as a way to have a kind of an instant if limited friendship with people you haven't met before. And for Wicked Wit, 
uh, I've been meeting a bunch of poets uh, that uh, at the uh, more twisted edge of their inwardness. But that's been fun. And uh, I have enjoyed it. And I think the three poems of that uh, have been honored as contest winners uh, are all excellent. They're wonderful poems. And the, uh, that uh, <clears throat> Diana Lee and Jason and I got along quite well at the, uh, the distance between Galveston where I live and uh, in Brooklyn where they are as we were, uh, uh, as we were um, doing the judging. That I am going to take this opportunity, since I have a few seconds left, um, to read a poem of my own. Uh, that this is, uh, it, it's a, about an aspect of, of writing poetry that I wasn't conscious, I was doing it, but I wasn't conscious that I was doing it when I was a very young poet. And finally, it occurred to me that one of the things I was doing was musical composition when I was uniting rhythmic motifs. I generally write in free verse of uh, uh, rhythmic motifs with, with sound values. Uh, and this poem is called <clears throat> The World and the Sound of Words. How they raise us in it, luft, lift, aloft, half flown to heaven on wingy fricatives as if you could go blind and words would be enough, deaf and the thought of words, numb, inert, your taste buds eroded, Car fragrances flattened like cardboard as in the body's age. But who doesn't want it all, the whole jumble of human delight, the gleam of a beer can lodged by the side of a freeway, grackle chatter, the Goldberg variations, sandpaper inches. Uh, oh, wait a minute, there's a, uh, another image here. Um, <clears throat> go, grackle chatter, the Goldberg variations, thup of a cork from a, 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 a dark glass bottle, sandpaper inchings towards sex before the Black and Decker whirr kicks in, hayfields at dusk after a hot day, releasing the long summer, wine from that bottle, sounds, roots. Thank you, Fran. Thank you, Poets of the Universe. Thank you, Houston. And more or less thank you to the kind of technology that always confuses people born before 1999. We all thank you, John. Blessings on us. It's Thank been an you, honor Jeff. and a joy. Um, I'd like to introduce all of you to Lydia Bodner Bala Hutrak, the artist who did our putative cover. Um, Lydia's work is in museums and private collections throughout the United States and Europe. And I'm so honored to have her do the cover for this anthology. Lydia? Well, thank you very much. And um, actually, I am very honored to have an image of my work on the cover um, of this collection of poems. And uh, Fran had asked me to read uh, my artist statement about the particular work that will be on the cover. So that is what I'm going to do. Um, and the title of the work, it's a miniature piece uh, when you see it. The title of the work is Mr. Bubbles. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have an image of it here to show you, but um, you have to imagine it from the words that I will share with you. Um, it's only nine inches by seven inches by three inches. And it was done in 2010, quite some time ago. I've always been fascinated with the power and metaphoric potential of words. Their multiple meanings and their ability to conjure up images or a story. Mr. Bubbles is part of a series of mixed media reliefs that are intended as visual plays on words or phrases. 
From within diminutive stages, miniature sculpted figures whimsically play out the words. They belong to a series called Boxed, and they are playful, concrete manifestations of the verbal. By association, Mr. Bubbles presents a deceptive appearance of strength in the context of a weightlifting macho man wearing a formidable mask of a horned bull. This pseudo strong man hides behind the bull's head in order to intimidate and overpower. He's a bullheaded bully. However, his body is flaccid and bulbously round, a laughable empty plastic shell with air bubbles in his groin and no guts. Mr. Bubbles is obviously full of hot air with bubbles that can be easily popped. Although this series of Boxed uh, is dated from 10 years ago, it's almost uncanny how this work speaks to 2020. Now, due to the pandemic, we're all finding ourselves boxed in one way or another and in our own personal bubbles. I have discovered that this art piece displays its own wicked wit. And I in invite you to enjoy it once you see it on the cover. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> so I know all of you have seen it either on our newsletter or um, in the uh, Eventbrite invitation, and it's a wonderful piece. The first place winner of the Wicked Wit contest is someone who may well be known to many of you. Um, Alice Fryman is the recipient of many honors, including two pushcart prizes and inclusion in Best American Poetry. Her latest book is Blood Weather from LSU Press. Um, Alice will be reading for the next 10 minutes and I'm really looking forward to that. Alice, welcome. Thank you. Uh, this is the poem that won. Um, it's called Shopping with Descartes. Descartes, remember, is the one who, whose mantra was, I think, therefore I am. Like a supermarket chicken, a brain weighs about three pounds, without feathers, of course. Thoughts like feathers weigh next to nothing, whimsies of no matter. What's a thought? A twitch? A little quiver in the jelly? quickened to life by a shock of electricity before slipping back into the fold it was born in. Still, thoughts are important. If I don't come up with a thought for three days, my brain morph morphs into a daisy stuck in the vase of my neck. After two weeks, I could generate a bouquet. People who think about thoughts are philosophers. People who think about thinking about thoughts are epistemologists. The book says God once had a thought, which he tucked inside a word, which makes God a linguist. It must have been a big word, an abracadabra word, powerful enough to create the sun, moon, earth, lions, tigers, birds, and bugs. Imagine, all in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. So tired from repeating his word, he had to go to bed without another thought in his head. And that's how we got the flowers. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me for laughing at my own jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and this one was a finalist. It's about sex. I don't have to explain that, do I? <laughs> it's called the eternal question. What's really behind the urge to merge? The kiss me quick, tremble, 
and undress. The grammar of the tongue, the diddle behind the shades of a late afternoon, all of which has been going on eons before we belly crawled out of the muck. Professors in laboratories with microscopes say the answer is genes. It seems we determined to spread them, which is why we shamelessly spew out hormones like an open hydrant, spread around to advertise the juice and readiness of the flesh. Let's see. The praying mantis loses his head in more ways than one to feed his lady love, all for them for a mob of offsprings he'll never meet. The kids turn out to be cannibals and devour each other, while he, poor thing, shined his shoes, put on a tie, promised her lunch, and ended up being it. To spread his genes? I don't believe it. Look. <laughs> I spread my genes a long time ago. They're out walking the, the earth, paying taxes, brushing their teeth, earning a living. They call, they write, they send Mother's Day cards. Will I still have Saturday picnics in bed with my sweet, not so young thing? The question is, since I don't have more genes to spread and neither does he, why is the flesh this morning still so flushed and flashing like a neon sign? This is called Once Upon a Time. I tell about a tour group traveling in a foreign country and of the woman who at a rest stop went inside to change her clothes. When she returned to the bus, where's the lady in the pink shirt? So a search party was formed and she joined in searching for herself. Not metaphorically as those words imply, Thoreau deep in Walden Woods, seeing himself in the soarings of a hawk, but actually, the way startled, you glimpse in a passing mirror yourself as stranger, an old lady wearing hurt on her face like an abandoned child. The question is, did she find herself? Or did someone else suddenly turn and say, you're it, you, the person everyone's looking for. Isn't that what we all want? To be the person everyone's looking for? Strapped in our seats, the bus stinking of diesel, heading north, south, anywhere, and for once, given a chance to claim a life of shining achievement just by changing a pink shirt to blue? Mother Teresa, Madame Curie, what? I could be Emily Dickinson in a white dress, having stuffed my green sweatshirt with the stained sleeves in a trash bin 60 miles east of Toledo. One more. Playing favorites. You ask how I feel about my body, my parts. When I was young, I loved my legs. Ah, the places they carried me, long legs, lovely legs. How I'd fling them about, wrap them around, don't ask. Later, I favored my teeth, especially after I almost lost them hitting my face on the steering wheel, seeing stars. Of course, there's the ongoing affair with hair. Who's not guilty of that? But now, as I'm getting on in years, I admit a certain fondness for my belly. 
I call her my cheese. Such a comfort. So easy to maintain, no plastic wrap or refrigeration necessary. Notice, I do not speak of insides, which tend to monitor themselves. Only my outer delineations, which I'm proud to say are immortalized in art. The Louvre, the Uffizi, the National Gallery, in niches or blazing from the wall, Venuses, graces, muses, bolder girls fattened on glory. Wear sunglasses. Stand in front of any one of Reuben's hefty beauties, proud of her dimpled cellulose and pudding flesh, and see front and center in all her excess, my belly. <laughs> that gurgling pillow that buttoned happiness, creamy soft, homegrown and spongy, my big mozzarella. I tell you, if I could bend myself in half, I'd eat me for lunch with a slice of tomato on a hunk of focaccia or good French bread. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful, Alice. <laughs> Thank so, you. Um, we have two runners up. The first um, person after Alice is Elena Petrova. Um, until 2007, <clears throat> Elena Petrova lived in Ukraine and worked in engineering management with two poetry books in English and one in her native Russian language. Her poems have also appeared in many prestigious journals and anthologies. Welcome, Elena. Prem, I will open my uh, document on the screen. Just make sure that I'm heard and I'm seen. I will read the three poems, uh, starting with uh, the one uh, from this anthology. Pencil. Sorry, I stole a pencil from the shepherd school to write this poem. Blessed uh, the bipolar, for they know which face they face. I shed silent tears and smiled as I walk Rice University trails. See, there is clover. Several drops by, of wild strawberries for those who bow to grass. And framed by boxwood shrubs is a bench on which a few springs ago I scribed, scribed my ESL homework. A 40 year old. Passing me, students would not have noticed the difference in our past. In a Kusturica movie about post war Yugoslavia, a photographer asked a group of peasants to smile at his camera. In dusty black suits, with copper wrinkles plowing their faces, they try, but their eyes are too full and the corners of their lips poorly cooperate. As ladies from the Woodway Bible class told me, we can't relate to those countries. You must be grateful the US adopted you. I'm grateful for this sunset piercing oak leaves with a green overripe grape, shepherd school windows that blind me with the sun, yet I see the blackboard with Copland's notes and young musicians bending with laughter like in a silent movie. I want to hear them, to adopt their past, a past I could not have. Here is your pencil. My second poem, or rather just a couple of fragments or sub-poems of a larger piece, which I wrote this uh, pandemic spring, is abandoned with birds, which is not uncommon this season. And it's called On Poise of Absentees. One, quiet choices. When I left the twilight woods of what I thought was me, an Asher Cardinal with a twiglet in her scarlet beak, 
alighted near my body, she mistook for no danger, something almost inanimate that shaped its absence to optics of blues. Hey, Blue Jay, here is another pecan. Will you catch this in the air? Flatten your anxious crest. Spread the gussy glass pattern of your wings. Future in this neighborhood comes meek, placid. A chair rail stained with shampoo and hair color and concluded by plaster long stars. Ceramic tile with white grout laid by a church friend who overcharged you. It's another child zoned to the former Robert E. Lee School. It's a couple in their 60s that postpone healing the spine of flexed weeks with a street milonga in San Telmo till the pandemic broke. It's a driveway of a, an engineer retired to his sister ranch in a small town in Arkansas that holds a molded mattress and a commode where jokers stuck plastic to lips. It's a flickering light of Fellini movies that none of them rent a red box. Hey, Blue Jay, crack your nut closer. The light reflects scattering in short waves faster than others, make the sky blue, bends in pockets of gray feathers to paint a Blue Jay. What optical illusion is this place? And my last poem is uh, dedicated to my husband because November 21st is a special day for me. 14 years ago, exactly on such day, I first stepped on Texas soil or rather in the Bush uh, airport. I came first time with a visa at that, that time and didn't know if I will even move to Texas. It, the poem called Walls. After your birthday dinner, you said life didn't turn out the way you wanted. Then who wanted the way it turned out? If no one, why did it turn out that way? I wanted a son, summers in a fisherman village, and an endless book where seagulls would dispute the catch of memories until silence deems the coral ashes of a shore and other planets rise with methane rivers that cleave their blue, craggy surfaces and geyser vapors that form into frozen particles the size of our house, rotate on a carousel of <coughs> orbital rings, gravitational ripples. <coughs> At night, I hear not only cicadas and alarms from distant parking lots, but the silence whose interpreting is my gift on the earth. I enter it, a swimmer who used to long for a lonely blue lab, a lover who's learned thousands of paths to almost unshareable joy, quiet rashes of musica universalis. With you, we are music. For you, I die, my nickel hair black, and feet into jeans are war at 17, when on foggy November stops, I waited for the lighted bus to take me uptown. There, after a day of threading water pipes at the factories, I would watch couples promenade along dark boulevards, road banisters run staircases as musical staves, elegant bookshelves and paintings behind high windows made me think of lives that turned out the way they wanted, clusters of grapes to minuets by Ramon. I cupped my hands to light a cigarette in the drizzle of an empty boulevard and drifted into idle reveries like those about couples waltzing at a candlelit Viennese ball and my grandparents who never danced but survived the famine together Frosted silence, congealed puddles, creased my movements when I struck a match. Planets rotated, looking down at its significance of any human story. 
But in many years, when I met you, something in their equations changed. The music in a darkened concert hall stopped being an oboe solo on the solitary spotlight. Gentle melodies wove into a bass line with a steady heartbeat, waltzed in a warming silence the way I wanted, the way it turned out. Thank you, Elena. That was lovely. Our next reader is the third place winner, Tim Mayo. His poem comes out of his work in a mental hospital and he lives in Southern Vermont. Tim. Thank you. Tim, we're not hearing You're you. muted, Tim. Sound is off. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to thank Public Poetry and uh, the uh, Wicked Wit judges uh, for the opportunity to, well, for choosing my poem and also for the opportunity of reading today. Um, um, and th both poems that uh, I'm going to read today, the first one being the anthology poem and the second one it sort of come out of a, a, a small book of poems that I've done on, um, uh, on my work uh, uh, in, in the mental institution. So I'll start first with um, the anthology poem, The Black Wolf of Your Past. Suppose you do change your life and the black wolf, which was once your shadow, silently howls against this extinction. What do you then do for this feral darkness out of which you grew, which has trailed you all your life with a loyalty reserved for pets? You see it, cower, shrink back deep into the doghouse of your thoughts, the long leash of its reach diminished. What do you do for this wolf you have fed since birth? Throw it a bone? <laughs> and uh, the, the second poem, which is also sort of uh, uh, revolves around a, you know, a central conceit um, is entitled um, The Elephant in the Room. Thick skinned, wrinkled and gray, it sits surrounded by eggshells. You must walk on, but not disturb. <laughs> Deus of denial and false complacency, ancient demon of faltering families, just when you think it's disappeared like an obsolete religion, fear of God, out of the corner of your eye, you see its long reach snake up to sniff you out. You see it sit again in the easy chair by the standing lamp, cross its legs, all big-eared and selectively deaf, then snap open the paper like a whip, make you jump, crush the shells. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was great. Um, our next poet to read is Andrea Messinio, and she is a psychotherapist and the author of Alone in Church by St. Julian Press, where this poem first appeared. Andrea. Thank you, friend. This is called Logos in Three Movements. It seemed at one time that the message I should write 
would spring forth entire like the facets of a jewel, each part connected to the next as with a running fire, giving off both light and heat against the darkness. And if I hurried, I could transcribe it all down before the vouchsafed image faded away. At another time, I shot up into the realm of ideas and covered myself with them as with clouds. I wielded them like hail or thunderbolts with nothing to dull their edge but a wry smile. But then came a warmth, a thawing, and I fell back down into a plotting world where I could no longer duel as by a half remembered craft, I placed one word before the other, then looked again to see what those together had made. And then, having forgotten the words, in horror of the game, I prayed to know where the bright images had gone. After a long time, deep underwater, I began to sense them bodied forth in all that is, thanks to his body. One need not see at all to work, it seems. I go as a blind craftsman by touch in the dark. Thank you. Thank you. That was lovely. Our next poet is Bill Carpenter. He is a member of the Ocean State Poets in Rhode Island. And he's recently begun to add animation to his poems in the hope of appealing to a wider audience. Welcome, thank you. Bill. Thank you, Fran, and thank you, Public Poetry, for this opportunity. Uh, the poem I'm going to read is called Ken and Love. And I've had I've raised two daughters in my life over a you know quite a span of time, actually. Uh, there's probably a good 15, 20 years between them. And so I had kind of intimate experience with the subject matter, Ken and love. Uh, for Ken, Barbie was the only woman, his Eve in their personal consumer heaven. It seemed as if they've always been together, lounging by the pool, driving to the mall in her Cadillac to shop for yet more wardrobe or just strolling through the pink domesticity of their life. He loved watching her strut across her fashion runway and pumps, modeling the latest in fake fur and denim mini skirts. But it was the swimwear that gave him pause, stirred in him a desire he couldn't fathom. Ken's dreams of Bobby were odorless and tasteless, but he ached to run his stiff fingers over the radiant, over her radiant acrylic skin, caress her nippleless breasts. He yearned to undress her, to see those parts always clothed in cotton bra and panties. Yet Ken had no idea what was expected of him. Of course they had kissed, though the click clack of their mouths meeting left Ken puzzled and their faces tarnished until he had to pull back, afraid of permanently chipping away his true love's lips. One weekend, returning from the mall, loaded down with shopping bags from BB, Polo, and Gap, Barbie suggested a candlelight dinner on the patio. She promised to wear her new silk evening dress and hit the dimmer switch on the floor lamp to simulate a soft moon glow. Later, they would sit 
side by side on the glider, set out in the back porch, and Ken would once again slide his left hand under the glistening, her glistening dress, up the lacy hose that graced her long legs. legs. Don't, she said with her eyes, not out of modesty, but as if she wished to spare him some great disappointment. As always, Ken pulled his hand away, knowing her protestations would grow ever more insistent, as if the imagined place were so forbidden, so dangerous to touch or even look upon it, would surely melt their plastic hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Cameron Cockling is a philosophy student at Pritzker College. He is thrilled that his first published work appears in the Wicked Wit Anthology, and we're thrilled to Cameron. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you for having me here, Brandon. and thank you to Public Poetry. This is my poem, Oneness is Kind of Symmetry. All about the field, is cold and familiar wind, unrest and indifference, outline of grass, wet leaf clinging to a branch, dampened granite, the heart still relying upon the unforgotten nights of chain link fences and stars, uncaring for the morning mists that fell in purple and red, which were loving and loved us, as it thought naive human caresses were the perfect touch. While we lay together in our tent, in the worst kind of isolation, unknowing, time passing silently, a bleeding coyote passed by and laughed, recognizing death's reflection. Thank you. Thank you. Carla Myers is a speculative, writes speculative memoir and lives in a tiny blue dot in the center of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Carla. Hi, thanks, Fran. I'm gonna read two short poems for you. The first one is called Chores. I begin a conversation with the catalog of despair I keep in my kitchen. Even though it's a hardback, its spine bends and it manages to slump in between my cookbooks. I can't tell if they're holding it up or squeezing it like a pig in a factory farm. I always have trouble distinguishing between the two. It's a strange catalog, no index, no alphabetical order, no order at all. It's purposely arranged in disorder, which is quite hard to do. I had to use pages 34 and 43, both entitled Oblate Spheroid. I finish the dishes, dry my hands, and try to slide it off the shelf. As usual, it resists, and we struggle while my tea gets cold. Eventually it gives up clenching its pages between its covers until it meets the table and throws itself open in indignation. I sip my cold tea and look at the pages on display. On one page is a report submitted by an anonymous observer. It reads in part, she looked anxious, humiliated or happy of that, I am certain. It had been notarized. The facing page was a drawing of a giraffe I had done as a child. It showed promise. I said, I wrote you, yet never get to pick what I see. It said, your father called, he wants his pencil back. Um, and my second one is called, you too can make a golem. You can make a golem from whatever crap you have lying around the house. Build one out of tampons. To animate him, make a ransom note cut from letters in women's magazines and staple it to the golem's head. Then send him to the drugstore to buy you more tampons. Be creative. 
Use that gunk in your drain traps. Don't mind the flies. You'll always be able to tell where he is, both from the drain stink and the buzzing. Have him do your evil bidding, like making brownies for the school bake sale. Who cares if he gets bio slime in the mix? You just wanted to donate $10 and be done with it anyway. Do not mold your golem out of your basket of unmatched socks. You will end up with a trite golem who says things like, oh, sweetie, kids sure can be mean. And please try to be mindful when playing with the deli slicer. If you make this golem accidentally, tell it to chop off its head in the deli slicer. Slap together a golem lawyer out of your cracked plastic box of dried up markers. Insist it write unintentional letters of intent. Send them to everyone you know, then deny you meant to do it. If you manage to make enough, start a klezmer band, link arms, and do the horror in the kitchen. Make them carry you high above their heads on a kitchen chair. Marry every single one of them and then kick them all to the curb. Thanks. Thank you. Our next poet is Christina Lovin, who lives in the knobs of Kentucky, where she collects wood, dust, rejection letters, and shelter dogs. Christina. Thank you. I think I'm unmuted. Um, I'm, oh, okay. Um, I'm going to read two poems. Uh, both are Villanelle. They're from a series of Villanelle that started out as being about weird insect facts, and somehow they all turned into anti-love poems. The first is the female praying mantis eats her mate. You do your yoga while I meditate on our love life and entomology. The female praying mantis eats her mate post-coitus when he won't capitulate to her urges. From pop criminology, go do your yoga, let me meditate on Bobbitt's spouse who was led to castrate. Personally, I call tautology the female praying mantis eats her mate or she doesn't. Don't underestimate my whetted interest in phrenology. Yes, I do yoga and I meditate, but give me your head. I'll gladly dictate your name on a page in martyrology. The female praying mantis eats her mate, but first she takes time to decapitate. Orpheus's lost head ain't just mythology. So you do your yoga. I'll premeditate how the female praying mantis eats her mate. And uh, the second one is Dung Beetles Find Home by Searching the Stars. This was the first of that whole series. I won't bore you with how it came about. Uh, but Dung Beetles Find Home by Searching the Stars. <clears throat> Dung beetles find home by searching the stars. Their shitty lives brightened by astral bliss, lost on fools and wanderers alike. Ours were the sun and moon, five houses, more cars, your kids, mine, a morning fuck, a good night kiss. Dung beetles find home by searching. The stars do not move. We did. Cornfields to sea to Mars, it seemed. The road not taken, always missed. Lost as fools and wanderers alike. Hours apart for years now, I push grief backwards. Tumbling this turd of pain like Sisyphus. Dung beetles find home by searching the stars, looking behind. Such power, avatars of love misguided, divorces and splits, lost on fools and wanderers alike. Our sparring aside, we might have healed those scars, but here's another way of saying this. Dung beetles find home 
by searching those stars lost on fools and wanderings like ours. Thank you. Thank you. Our next poet is Deborah D. Nicola. Um, she says, this poem was the result of a high school reunion and it is somewhat exaggerated, but basically on the money. Deborah. Yes. Um, okay, I'm waiting for that to disappear. Carolyn's pillow. That phone call from Carolyn after she'd left the reunion, we had to find her left behind pillow. But my head was on backwards, like Dante's astrologers condemned for jumping the proper timelines. Blame the champagne from the night before and the cannabis and the wine and maybe even the mahi-mahi. But I think it was more from the shock what I'd done with a guy I scarcely knew in high school. Throw in the old Catholic claw coming out of the hotel wall, wrenching a few drops of snarky guilt out of my sweaty hair, remembering his hands on me and in me, and mostly something about our mouths, like a couple of lowered buckets into a desert well. And did I really bellow? It's been eight years to unlock the right rooms and locate the pillow, his spitfire Spanish and waving dinero scattered the maids to search all tres cientos, while my sense of timing pressed on with no rationale but a need to get out of Dodge, press a foot to the floor and hydroplane over the Florida tarmac like a thief with jewels sewn into a backpack. He had a ticket to fly and my phone knew the route to a terminal and we did retrieve Carolyn's pillow, but no major scandal. So in the end, I was grateful for the rabbit hole fallen through or whatever the whole Michigas meant. Thank you, Deborah. Our next poet is Clela Reed, who is the author of seven collections of poetry and is the current Georgia Author of the Year for her chapbook, Silk. Welcome, Clela. Thank you. Thank you, Fran. And thank you, Public Poetry. This is a great event. What fun. Um, so I'm here in the virtual homely, homeliness shelter. This is not my home. This is the homeliness shelter. Spend a day at the homeliness shelter. I misread the announcement calling for homelessness aid, and for a moment, it made perfect sense. At last, a place for bad hair days, allergy eye mornings, time of month bloat, a place for zit eruptions, cold sore attacks and sunburn peel, a place where they have to take you in temporarily when you're down on your primp and prissy luck there, a motherly sort greets you at the door, clucks sympathy, hands you a cup of tea, and escorts you to a quiet room where she plops you into an overstuffed chair covered in chintz, smelling of verbena and rose. She'll make the sick day calls to your boss or school or board. She'll give you e-devices to bridge this day away, keep you connected, but sheltered, unseen, a voice on the phone, perhaps if necessary, one that's strangely giddy, slightly muffled, sounding for all the world like one munching cookies. Thank you. Sorry, I have a cat that is climbing all over. Um, okay. Our next poet is Ellerane Lockie. She is widely published and awarded as a poet, nonfiction book author, flash fiction author, and essayist. Please welcome Ellerane. Elaine, you're still muted. You need to turn your. All right. Is there that... you go. That's it. Oh, okay. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Public Poetry, for running such a fun contest. Um, I'm, my, the poem that I'm going to read is from my most recent chapbook collection, Sex and Other Slapsticks. And it's 26 pages, and every poem in it has won um, some kind of contest award. Uh, title is Nomenclature in Montana. As children, there were no body part words for what the cows, horses, pigs, chickens, cats, and dogs were doing. But we all knew they were making babies and that it was as good and happy as a 60 bushel wheat crop. This simplicity moved right into our farmhouses where language for bodily functions became necessary. My father used piss hole and asshole when he told stories to his cronies. My mother preferred a more refined number one place and number two place for my brother and me, like they were addresses. I didn't know anything about number one and a half place until this basement flooded red after I turned 14. Exploration led to the discovery that number one and a half was multi-storied and that an entire finger could visit and that it would receive and even welcome house guests. No one talked about this kind of real estate back then. I didn't know the word vagina until junior class biology. I learned I wasn't alone when the boy sitting next to me whispered to his buddy that it was really a twat, a word I'd heard in the halls and thought was the past tense of twit. But I liked thinking of it as my little piece of property how its value increased exponentially when it served as an annex through which two daughters passed, how it's slowly becoming a historic site. Who knows how many men who slept there will prove to be famous. Thank you. Thank you. Our next poet to read is Jean Grabener, who has including two chapbooks. His poems have been published in the Cafe Review, Comstock Review, Poet Lore, Slant, Jewish Currents, J Journal, Passenger. Please welcome Jean Grabener. <clears throat> Hi. I want to thank Public Poetry and Wicked Writ for number one, accepting my poem, and for the opportunity to read. <clears throat> By the way, Fran, would you please put me in touch with Carla, because I have a poem that has a golem in it. Okay. So, here we go. Frank R. Stockton in Kansas. Now we're in Kansas, where we learn they first fought the Civil War, and where Neanderthal once roamed with Brontosaurus, like in the Flintstones, as the plaque proclaims. Here's where a twister touched down and delivered Dorothy to kill a witch. Even if you play it safe, things happen. Like this woman in Salina, who goes to the ladies' room and runs into a tiger escaped from the shrine circus. No choice of which door. Here it is. Thank you would you, have Jean. to have read The Lady or the Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jean. Our next poet is Greg Moglia. He's a full-time poet writing about the foibles of midlife dating the challenge of aging parents, the sweetness of lovers, both old and new. Greg. Please uh, unmute yourself so we can hear you. That should be on the, there we go. Okay. Thank you, public poet and uh, Thank you, Fran. And here goes. Death comes to match.com. Edie sounds so great on the phone. 
We both love Roy Orbison. Imagine that. She says she makes a great pasta primavera. She's Irish American, but cooks Italian. Imagine that. Sullivan that cooks Italian. We set a date at Tony's, but then she calls, says her dad is ill, his heart. We may have to change plans. And then she calls and says, we lost dad. Oh, I say, so sorry. I hang up and read in the paper, Sullivan obit and the funeral home location. Oh man, do I pay my respects as a first meeting? I decide to go and bring a bouquet for her, him, I'm not sure. Once there, I see her father laid out. A good looking guy, appears so serene, I sense I can speak to him. So when it's my turn to kneel and pray at the casket, I say to him, Mr. Sullivan, you don't know me, but I'm really here to meet your daughter. I want to let you know I'm not interested in a quickie or anything like that. I would love to find someone and have a long-term relationship. Now, as I look directly at him, I think I see a change. He seems to have a smirk that says, please, no bullshit. It gets to me, so I say in a respectful whisper, sir, your daughter is a piece of ass and I really want to get laid. With that, her father's face seems to be at peace. I get up, and when I turn, here's Edie with a sad smile. Nice of you to come. I'll call soon. By the way, did I see you talking to my dad? No, no, I say. I was praying, praying. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Our next reader is... Jessica Siobhan Frank, and she's a poet who intercepts daily adolescent eye rolls from her kids because they don't appreciate her humor. Jessica. Thank you, Fran. <clears throat> and thanks, uh, Wicked Wit and Public Poetry, for giving this poem a home. Erotic Tales from the MLA Handbook. Turn me on with your academically appropriate language. I want to know all about your scholarly sources, how you list them in your works cited, that sexy hanging indent on the second line always gets me hot and bothered. And when it's correctly alphabetized, my face flushes with anticipation. Whisper that you will cite internally, properly, contextualized and introduced. Four lines of prose and suddenly I'm breathing heavy when you show me your block quote. The room spins as you sweet talk me with the differences between primary and secondary sources. My God, you've done this before, haven't you? Put Times New Roman on and we can 12 point font it all night long. I'm going to scream about standard formatting and don't you stop until I hear it's one inch all around, baby, because size definitely matters. You have centered the title too, and I want your last name and page number in the top right corner, every page, every night. As my red pen runs down the margin, I see every line is double spaced, and I want to grade it right now. I'm a wild woman, I can't help myself. Hand it in, baby. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Okay, where are we? I've lost my place, excuse me. Um, yes, John Milkwright is, a wide, is widely published, including his most recent book, Drive the World in a Taxi Cab. Please welcome John Milkwright. Thank you, Fran. Uh, thank you for this uh, funny poetry business. I've really enjoyed it and I've enjoyed listening. Uh, my poem is after uh, Cesar Viejo, uh, the famous Peruvian poet. 
It's called On the Occasion of My Boring Death. I will drive, I, I will die in Houston on an overcast afternoon. On a day I've already forgotten, I will die in Houston and who really cares? Maybe it's a Saturday. I will wear a plain t-shirt, Levi's jeans and Dockers shoes with Navy socks. A Folgers can will hold the ashes of my creation, cremation, although Maxwell House will do if the coffee grounds you removed are caffeinated. At the reception, you will search for an extended metaphor with deviled eggs and rebirth that somehow I never really understood since there won't be enough paprika. There has never been enough paprika. John Denver will play Take Me Home Country Roads. You will bring potato salad that won't be German potato salad. That recipe has always been screwed up. Your memory of me saying I liked it before is not wrong. I had just lied. You will choose unscented flowers instead of my favorite stargazer lilies. They remind you of your father's death. Voices will begin to subside and leave early. Mosquitoes will bite the children playing in the backyard. And who can really blame them? Rain will begin to fall as cl friends climb in their hybrid cars, drowsy, my witnesses will remain in the wake, the record player, the guppies in the tank, the leftovers. Thank you, John. Thanks. Appreciate it. Our next poet is Catherine Howe. Mahan, who writes and teaches fairy tales in Ithaca, New York. Her most recent collection of poems is A Slow Bottle of Wine. Catherine. Thank you, Fran. My poem is in the voice of a maintenance worker talking to a fellow worker about what happened last evening. Hazel tells Laverne. Last night, I'm cleaning out my Howard Johnson's ladies room. When all of a sudden, up pops this frog. Must have come from the sewer swimming around and trying to climb up the side of the bowl. So I goes to flush him down. But so help me God, he starts talking about a golden ball and how I can be a princess. Me, a princess. Well, my mouth drops all the way to the floor. And he says, kiss me, just kiss me once on the nose. Well, I screams, ya little green pervert. And I hits him with my mop and has to flush the toilet down three times. Me, a princess. Thanks, Catherine. Our next poet is Kathleen Cook who has enjoyed a rewarding career as a teacher of English and German. A lifelong resident of South Texas, she's been writing since childhood. Catherine. Catherine? 
Ah, okay. We're going to skip over Catherine at the moment and possibly we will come back to her if Carrie can arrange that. Thank you. Our next reader is Lisa Creech Bledsoe. She's a hiker, beekeeper, and writer living in the mountains of North Carolina. Lisa? Well, Lisa's the other person who's disappeared. <laughs> Never mind. We do have more poets, I promise. Mark Svenvold was born in San Antonio, grew up in Seattle, and now lives on a farm in New Jersey. Mark, are you with us? You just need to put your sound on because you're muted at the moment. Sorry, I thought I, am I? Yeah, you're good now. I'm good now, okay, sorry. I thought I had no, sorry. Thank you, friend, for uh, doing all this. Thanks everybody, I've been uh, sending it just sort of uh, sending everyone lines that I've loved uh, from the poems that I've heard. It's uh, it's fun. Uh, this is a poem that came out of a, an assignment I gave my students. Uh, I, one of the things we did was pass around a hat filled with uh, lines that they had written, and we had to take a line out and then incorporate that seamlessly into the poem. And also, we had to tell a joke in the poem. Uh, it's called "Selfie with Cathedral." Uh, and the line I, I picked out of a hat was blow out the black sky, which, I'm, and so, you know, a little overwrought, yes. <clears throat> so I'm trying to, um, all right, so blow out the black, black sky is the epigraph. If it's not too much trouble, if it's not too much to ask, when you're done with it, I mean. And the moon, you know, that billiard cue with the sign that says, sponsored by, blow that out too. Blow out the black sky, if you would, and bring in the blue. The party members from Shangdu have most of all the money in the world. They tour the Museum of Europe, kicking its tires. But the Museum of Europe is closed for lunch. What to do but wait for the 13th century to return while the markets flicker on a screen. Meanwhile, zucchini flowers, flour dusted and fried, you can eat them with your hands amid the smell of sweet smoke and cheese, the sun warm on your arm. And Eurydice sits down next to you on a bench and doesn't speak, lights a cigarette, blows out the match and looks at the view of fields across an Etruscan valley thick with gurgling agriculture and waits for you to make a smart remark. And sometimes there's nothing to say. The 13th century depicts this as a dove because you have to put something up there, I guess, and called it many things. Holy Ghost, the slender reed that becomes the hand of God, depending on the artist and the period. I prefer a pagan girl whose story no one knows, the blank field of her, the whole history of erasure, her resume, a white fog upon the lip of the world overwritten. And when the Chinese bankers rise to present their tickets for the show, it's a good one. Alleluia's carry zeros from the stone, loft upward the joke of heaven about a clock dial recording sins committed. It spins like a ceiling fan or a church turnstile clicking. The confessionals, empty, are booths for kids to play secrets in. Nuns, shoo them out. Even a scold in Italian is lovely. Light a candle for a dead pet or the national debt, flicking too fast for the eye to track. It's all symbolic. And someone comes at night to blow it out. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. 
Our next poet is Richard Levine, the author of Richard Levine, Selected Poems and Contiguous States, as well as five chapbooks. He grows marinara sauce and minestrone in a garden in upstate New York. Richard. Hi. Um, like all of you, I've been missing readings a lot. So this has uh, been a wonderful hour listening to all of you. And thank you, Fran, for inviting me into the anthology and to this reading. This uh, poem is called What? No Chocolates? I went to five florists before finding roses with thorns still pointing from their stems, like arrowheads from a quiver, like the lances of hard riding chain mailed knights. I purchased them for lovers that failed beyond a few fleshy unions. I purchased them for flirtations that sparked but failed to flame. I purchased them for women who still haunt me when I'm making love with my wife and for the solitary dark that sometimes wakes me with its silence and the catch of my own breath to find myself erect and near weeping. And I swear these roses and I swear on these roses and my thorn bloodied hands, these are for you. And I'm on my way right now to the only place you, like my muse, have ever been alive. Thank you. Thank you. I believe Kathleen Cook is ready to join us, so. Yes, so, um, yes. So, hi everyone, I'm Carrie. So sadly, Kathleen is not here on the Zoom with us. However, she was nice enough to send us a video of her performing one of her poems. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully we can um, all watch and admire her poem together. Okay, can everyone see my screen? No. Yes. No. But there's nothing on it. It's just black. There we go. Yes, okay. Ah. You got it now. Sort of. Okay. Uh, okay, let's hope this works. A pop up, uninvited, neither foreseen nor foretold, unwanted visitor. Left a blank calling card, no callback number. This fly-in had no image, was not dark nor light, no face to pick out in a lineup, unmistakable only by its essence, the unknown. No flag, uniform, or badge clothed it, no colors, scents, and most vividly, no words. PIA found me one Saturday morning, a morning hardly different from a thousand others, but forever set apart by grand larceny, the robbery of words. With no words, no syntax appeared, no morphemes to build the extraordinary flower of the language I had known better than the back of my hand. Stolen by the unknown one, no warning shot fired. And then at once, apparently, all was returned, and I could stutter an odd first word, unknown. Was I free to go my old way, resume the life I'd known, where every step had an accompanying word?
Well, okay. Okay. Well, Could that's just all step off the screen, Carrie, please. Thank you. So, our next poet is. Is Susan Pashman here? Yes, I am. Excellent. Susan <laughs> Pashman is a philosophy professor and novelist, and she wrote this poem in a writing group stirred by a prompt of the third plate of Hogarth's illustrations for A Rake's Progress. Susan. Um, while everybody has expressed their gratitude for being here, I have to tell you, I'm absolutely stunned to find myself here um, because I guess I've published two poems in crazy places, but I've never really thought of myself as a poet. And I only wrote a poem to this prompt because I couldn't think of the usual witty essay that I would write to prompts. Um, so it, unlike the poems of all you serious poets, uh, this one is metrically tight and full of rhymes. That will show you what an amateur I am. Uh, yes, this, this was prompted by one of the, the uh, lithographs, I guess it is, that Hogarth did to illustrate um, the rake's progress. At yon round table sprawls a rake, a dissolute beloved by girls who cannot but great notice take of how that handsome flaunts his curls. For nothing draws a maid like hair on heads or chests or arms or cocks or makes the fair sex wish him bare so much as long and golden locks. The lad kicks back and quaffs his wine while ladies hasten to undress. He'll have them here if he's inclined. There's not one craving he'll suppress. It's almost midnight by the clocks when he espies a spirited mare of ivory breast and ruddy hocks and silken cheeks and ankle fair. Soon thinks he of the sounds she'll make when once beneath him she's supine, moans and sighs she will not fake, the thrilling trembling down her spine. But he dreams, but as he dreams, this other pearl, her hand maneuvering in his shirt, to toy with all his hairy swirls, does show herself a worthy flirt. You are some wench, says he, a fox. I'd like you both, I must confess. And if I did not fear the pox, tis a desire I'd soon address. Thus Hogarth did with beauty's line, portray an orgy for our rake, all youthful flesh and joy divine, and time well spent for pleasure's sake. Why pass the time with other jocks at checkers, horses, cards, or chess? This lad will say when old age knocks, I fondled girls and thus progressed. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Our next poet to read is Michael Shine, who married Carol, raised two daughters, and founded Lit Fuse Poets Workshop. So he got three things right, as well as a poem. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Tran. And uh, it's really an honor to read with so many wonderful poets. Uh, the poem that was included is actually from my book, Liquid Perishable Hazardous. Can you turn up the your volume a little? Oh, sure. I think. Um, if it's hard to hear me, I could put in these headphones. They might work better. Let's see. Does that make it easier to hear? Yes. Thank you. Great. OK, the poem's called Not Saying the F Word. You can't say the F word at Thin Man Books. It's a Amelie Rendley bookstore, illed to the brim with delicate ears. It's like a church consecrated to the word that can't be spoken. Children, exotic bonsai, are fertilized, pruned, and worshiped. 
If you ain't say the F word, then I'm almost certain you ain't say the C word either. But you n probably say suck since every baby does it and teenagers use it constantly. The vernacular for bowel movement is dicey. Let's assume you ain't a the S word either. Makes it hard to tell uck like a baby from uck the bad word, but better eighth than ari. That till leaves hundreds of thousands of words with which to express yourself. Oh, as my author used to a, quit your itching. Not exactly. I, I oppose we ain't a the B word either. It's a Amelie Rendley Oak store dedicated to readum of peach. And as poets, our duty is to e erdius and not a anything controversial. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. This is um, actually our last reader for this event. However, there are a number of other readers included in the anthology who for one reason or another couldn't be with us today. I wanna to really thank every single poet who is here, including those in our audience. One of the things that we usually do is a group photo that includes everyone. So those of you who have your video turned off, please do turn it on and we'll do a group photo. The anthology is, is available on Amazon. However, in its own turn of Wicked Wit, it appears on Amazon without its cover. So that will be rectified in the next week or so. If you want, you can buy what's bound to be a collector's edition of Wicked Wit with a black wordless cover, or you can wait for the absolutely wonderful artwork that Lydia Bodner Bella who tracked it for Wicked Wit. I would also add that all of the poets in the anthology have for the most part included their email address so you can find out more or rather their website so you can find out more about them and their work in the anthology. Um, so do we have everyone's camera turned on so that we can do our final group photo? Carrie, can you handle that? Um, yes, I'm trying to get people to turn on their cameras. You may get a message from me saying, please turn on your camera. It seems we, um, some, you may not be able to turn on your camera if you're using a device that doesn't have one. So, um, you know, can't get, we can't get it. Um, it looks like we have about three people who need to turn theirs on. That's okay. I mean, it is what it is, right? Yeah. The COVID times. So just go ahead and do that. Okay. So here at Public Poetry, when we take pictures, we like to say um, poetry instead of, for example, cheese. So we'll go one, two, three, everyone will say poetry and we shall take our amazing picture. We will have to do a few, do it a few times since so many amazing people will join this event. We have two whole tabs of people to capture. Okay. Is everyone ready for our first round of pictures? Okay, one, two, three, poetry. Poetry. Beautiful, okay, second round. Okay, we have our second round. One, two, three, poetry. Poetry. <laughs> That's the spirit. Okay, we have our amazing pictures. Thank you, y'all. Thank you, Carrie. Um, we still have maybe five minutes or so. And I'm thinking if any of you have any questions, if you'd like to, of any of the poets or would like to comment in any way, Perhaps you could raise your hand and Carrie will unmute you and we can have a little bit of a conversation before this all ends. So 
Anybody have any thoughts, comments, suggestions, ideas? Don't be shy. Thank you, Fran, for doing this. Oh, that's fine. John, can you unmute yourself, please? Go to the... I can. Good. Well, this has been wonderful. Mm -hmm. And once um, COVID is over, all of you poets who are living elsewhere should move to Houston and we will reinvigorate the local poetry scene from America's hidden capital of poetry. Thank you. Thank you, John. Anyone else have thoughts, comments, ideas? Well, if none of you do, then I would just mention, um, Richard, did you have something to say? You... Yes, I just wanted to uh, another thanks, and particularly because of the uh, the uh, witty focus of these poems uh, in this dark time. We can all use a little more laugh, and I I admire all the poets because we know that to uh, it makes you even more vulnerable. I think to uh, write something where part of your objective is to be silly and to make people laugh at uh, your thought. So uh, thank you all. Thank you for that. Yeah. Anyone else? So anyone at all? Okay, then I would just like once again to thank all of you and to mention that we are a membership organization and it would be absolutely wonderful if all of you decided to become members. We'd really appreciate that because that's what supports the work that we do. And I also hope that you will respond to our latest contest. You have over a month to write a poem to one or more of the um, film and video clips. And I hope some of you will choose to do that. I hope many of you will choose to do that. Thank you, everyone. Ah, and this recording, um, the entire program will be on um, our YouTube channel, which is Public Poetry Houston. I think Carrie will be able to get that up for us by Wednesday of next week, won't you, Carrie? So um, you can invite friends, family, other people, whoever you like to um, view the video and you're welcome to do it yourselves. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good stuff, everyone. Good stuff. Enjoy. Bye. Thank you.